All right, welcome to the uh, third lecture in this course. We continue from what we were doing last time. We were looking at uh, this particular diagram about life cycle cost and its importance. And this diagram nicely captures the importance of cost in aircraft design. In fact, it said that uh, whether military aircraft or transport aircraft or any aircraft, actually cost is nowadays the key. It is the main criteria, it is the main consideration. Okay? And therefore, it is very important that we establish what is going to be the cost, not just the initial cost, but the cost which will be incurred over the lifetime of the aircraft, including the cost which will be incurred in retiring the aircraft. So, what do you think is the cost involved in retiring an aircraft? What happens to the aircraft when it retires? Where does it go? Or what happens to it? What do you think? Huh? Yeah, raise your hand so that we can have some decorum. Anybody else? I mean, I would like to give chance to new people also. Yes, anybody? Yes. Loudly. It goes to a museum. So, there are let us say 5000 of 737s produced. They are all in 5000 museums. My God, they will have no real estate left if you put everything in a museum. Yes, please. Please mention your name also so that we get to know. Yes. Naveen, yes, maybe. Future research. What do you do with the old aircraft? What kind of research can you do? It is old. As you know, the aircraft is designed 20, 15 years before it is used. And when it is in service, it will spend 20, 50, 30 years. Of what use is for future research an old aircraft? Hardly any use for research, I think. Yes. Pritam, uh, break it down, salvage for parts uh, or at least the raw materials. Okay. Salvage for parts, it is only possible if that is still flying. Right? Because I cannot put part of this record on that aircraft. Oh, not just those parts. Hmm. Instrumentation. Instruments. instruments will be old, 20 years. See, aircraft is retired. Everything in it is almost useless. Almost useless. You cannot say this aircraft had some uh, airspeed indicator which was purchased so many years ago. Now let us use it. It is going to be of no use. By this time, there are so many new. But at the very least, what about the um, metal? Yes, uh, metal can be sold as scrap. So, aircraft are sold by kilogram at the end. <laughs> Do not laugh at it, they are sold by kilograms. You will be surprised, our department has sold some aircraft by kilograms. We were gifted two aircraft and they are lying outside. There was one uh, uh, helicopter called uh, Hiller H2 uh, and there was one small aircraft called Mastani, which was one of the first jets used by the Air Force. We were gifted them by the Air Force. Slowly they began collecting rust and you know the weather in the city. So, they became an eyesore. So, we decided let us get rid of them. So, there was a tender and they were sold by kilograms and the department made some money in selling an old aircraft. Okay. So, yes, aircraft are sold by weight at the end, okay. but taking out metal from a old aircraft involves expenditure. So, the person who buys it does a calculation. Okay. Is there any copper in the aircraft? Is there any other rare metal? Is there any useful material which can be sold? How much will I spend in cutting it, removing the material, throwing the rubber, throwing the glass, throwing the useless things? So, they work out and then they decide and then they make a coat and then it is lifted by kilogram, uh, sold by kilogram and then it is done. Now, this is okay for metallic aircraft. Now, so in this, so that means if you have an old metallic aircraft, you may end up making some money, right, by selling the material. Now, what happens if you have composites? You have a nice beautiful 787 made up of principally glass carbon fiber and glass fiber. This is the answer to one of the questions in the quiz. The principal material of Boeing 787 Dreamliner is glass is carbon fiber on the on the airframe. Okay. What happens to carbon fiber after 20, 30, 40 years of use? You may have to pay money for disposing it because it does not degrade and you cannot do anything with it. So, the disposal cost which was positive for the old aircraft is now a big cost for concern. It can be negative. You may incur a huge cost, environmental cost, 
Okay. Have you heard about ship breaking yards? Right. So what they do is they get these huge ships and they cut the whole thing and remove the asbestos from inside which is a cancer producing device. So that is why other countries do not want it and some countries say okay we will take it, we will cut it, we will clean it. So this is a huge problem. So yes, you can use composites, they give you very good uh, stunt to weight ratio, they are very nice etc, etc. But then what happens to them? So one has to be very careful in design, in selection of a material unless you have an action plan about what to do with it, can be disastrous. So it is very important, a decision like using carbon fiber so that the aircraft is light, so that it consumes less fuel. It may become an eyesore and a problem at the end of its retired life because you may incur so much expenditure in getting rid of it, it may actually eat away half the benefits of low fuel consumption, can happen. So one has to be very careful, okay. Now there is a paradigm shift which happens every few years in every field, okay. In aircraft design, in the early 40s, people were worried about crossing the transonic barrier, <coughs> sonic barrier, flying faster than speed of sound. Performance at any cost was the motive because the aviation was in infancy and performance was the main driver. So nobody really bothered much about cost, they worried about how to achieve the performance. Slowly in 1970s when there was a huge oil crisis all over the world and many airlines realized that these nice beautiful aircraft are good but they guzzle a lot of fuel and therefore they become uneconomical and one aircraft especially 727, it had to be virtually scrapped because it was completely unacceptable from the fuel consumption point of view at that time. So design to cost came as one particular, so the students of aircraft design who were doing their research in 70s, they were looking at design to cost paradigm. How can you design an aircraft which can meet A, B, C, D requirements within a per unit cost of so much or you know, unit cost for so many aircraft production, uh, so much. Slowly in the year 2000, etc., it moved to not just initial cost. You can have an aircraft with low initial cost, but it may be, you know, so expensive to operate throughout its life that it will be a problem. So then design to life cycle cost became a paradigm, okay. So this is how things have changed. So today when aircraft are ordered, when you look at any current aircraft order by any airline or by any manufacturer, especially for military aircraft, they always say we want this, 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 per unit cost should be less than so many million. So cost becomes a target right in the design nowadays, okay. Now cost is not something that remains constant, yes, so what do you mean by LCC? That life cycle cost, I explained that in the previous slide. LCC is life cycle cost, the cost incurred in an aircraft over the entire life cycle from conception to retirement. So requirements never remain constant, they always creep, they always slowly, slowly over a period of time change, okay. And so therefore you are stuck with an aircraft which has been designed for some requirements but the requirements have now changed slightly. So you are going to incur larger expenditure than what you planned for. So you have to budget for it right in the beginning that these requirements for which we are designing will not remain constant, they will change. There are many examples of in recent history about cost escalation. Some of them are B2, F22, F35, okay. I would urge you to look at all these. These are three examples. So F35 is the current villain about the costing because the escalation in cost has been so high that people are now wondering whether it was a good decision to select this aircraft in the competition. So it will be interesting and uh, on the Moodle page I would like to start a discussion on cost escalation of these three aircraft, B2. So I wanted to figure out what was the initial cost proposed for how many aircraft, what happened, how did it go, where are we today and what are the, what are the issues. But limit your discussion only to the cost, do not talk about other technical problems in F35, etc. Just focus on the cost, so you should be able to sensitize yourself about how with the best intentions, with the best brains, the designers plan something 
but things ultimately turn out to be something else. So these are three examples in the recent history of cost escalations, but escalations have always happened. In almost every project there have been cost escalations and not always can you blame the designer for bad design. There could be changes in the scenarios, changes in the funding, etc. So there are many reasons, but it will be nice if you can bring out some design features because of which there has been a cost escalation. Okay. Right. Now here is a graph which I have borrowed from Professor Scott Eberhardt's uh, notes. Incidentally, Professor Scott Eberhardt currently he is in Melbourne uh, taking a class like this on aircraft design. But he was here with us for a semester in IIT Bombay, uh, 2012 I think or 13, uh, okay. And uh, at that time we both shared our notes. So many of my notes are used by him and many of his notes are used by me. So we had an agreement to borrow our material with each other. So thanks to him for permitting me to use his material as and when I feel uh, need. This particular slide is very interesting. It actually puts all the things in perspective. So it says that the design requirements which are basically musts and wants. What you must have, those are the requirements. You can't make an aircraft without those requirements. And objectives are what I would like to have. I would like to have some things, some features. So we have to first, so when you have the requirements and the desirables, I would say, you start the process. So you look at, you know, the trade studies, which is what we will start doing very soon. What is a trade study? So trade study basically means what do I trade off for benefit? So if you look at a trade study between aspect ratio, paper ratio, sweep, I, I hope you understand the meaning of all these terms. Okay. So can we increase the aspect ratio and that will lead to, you know, uh, lower fuel consumption but it will be a heavier aircraft. But will the lower fuel consumption net benefit, uh, will it lead to that benefit? So these are called as trade-offs. So that's why they are called as trade studies. In trade studies, certain design parameters are varied to find the best combination to meet your objectives better. So, and these trade studies involve various disciplines. Okay, the disciplines which normally play a role are already mentioned there. So they are all encompassing in the whole uh, scenario of trade studies, but they have to be kept within the ambit of factors factors like marketing because when an aircraft is produced, ultimately it is produced basically for being sold. Nobody designs an aircraft and put it in a museum. The intention of aircraft design is essentially to sell it. So the marketing department is very important because they are in touch with the actual customer requirements at least for today and for the near future. So their inputs are very important. Also, it's important, the marketing department also knows what is available and what is being supplied and promised by the other competitors. Okay. Typically, a market, uh, a market scenario is where both or three, four, five companies are going to compete for the same order. Okay. So it's important that, it's important that you should know what others are offering, how my product is better, how I can modify my product to meet a particular market. They keep on interacting with the airlines to find out what are the new routes, new operating scenarios which are being planned. So they are also important. Then you can do so many things unless you have resources, unless you have the technology, unless you have the expertise, you cannot do it. So within the constraint of resources, there are many other external factors, so many you cannot even name them. All of them are going to be a boundary within which this whole exercise takes place. And when all, all this thing is done, you have what is called as the integrated design. You then ask questions, okay, does it meet the objectives? Does it meet the design requirements and objectives of the DROs? If the answer is yes, you say, okay, let's start making it now. If no, you go back. And when you go back, what you will do? Either you will question the requirements. You will say these requirements are too stringent. Can you relax them because aircraft is unwieldy? Or you might say, oh, during these times the constraints have changed, new constraints have emerged, assumptions might change about the market, about the scenario. So then you go back and you keep on doing this till you reach a stage of convergence and then you take a decision enough, now we start producing the aircraft. But when we do this whole process, we come across a very serious constraint. 
this constraint I want you to appreciate. It is a very simple thing. It is called as a design spiral and in this spiral on the x axis we have how much choice do you have as a designer in making changes or choosing configuration items or choosing options. On the y axis you have how much do you actually know about your design. So as it turns out when you start you have a complete choice. So today for example if I float some requirements to this class and I assume that all of you are experienced and qualified designers and if I say let us design something I give some requirements to you, you have complete choice, you have all the choice, you can start from anywhere because there is a clean sheet of paper. But what is your knowledge about your design? It is nil because you have not done anything. You start designing. So let us say after some discussion, after some analysis, after some study, you say okay, let us go for uh, let us go for a turbojet engine because we believe turbojet engine either because it is available in the country easily or because we got a good deal from a company about turbojet and also because it meets our mission requirements. So you decide we will use turbojet engine. So you have some more knowledge about your design but now your choice has reduced. Once you decide turbojet other options are now not available to you. As you proceed further and further it is a very very serious dilemma that we all face. The more we the more we do the more helpless we feel because the more we do the more we fix things and then the room for maneuver or room for change is limited. In the end we know everything but we cannot do anything. In the beginning we know nothing but you can do everything. So this design spiral it is not only for aircraft, it is for any engineering design. So it is important to note that options and variable uh, choices available to you are going to consistently decrease. In the end you will actually be reaching a stage when you are frozen into configuration. So the intelligence is how you do this process in such a way that you make minimum regrets later on. You ask any designer at the end of the design and they will have only regrets. Okay. They will say, oh, if I wish I knew that this will happen, you know, I could have done something about it because which part of the aircraft will become a problem you know only when it actually goes to the market or in the operating scenario. In the beginning you must have thought that will not. Now do you think Boeing people knew anything about the problem with batteries which grounded their aircraft and caused them more than 200 million dollar loss, okay, it's silly thing like a battery. Such a complicated aircraft, fantastic design features, new configuration, totally new approach and the whole thing is grounded because of a battery and that too overheating. Okay. So today is Boeing, now is Boeing 77 people, what will they say today? I wish I had an idea that there will be a battery issue, I would have spent more time and effort in choosing a better manufacturer for a battery because they claim that there has been a problem from the manufacturer side. There is a Japanese manufacturer, okay, I think it is Sanyo and they made some problems in supplying the battery as per the specifications. So why do not you read up about it? This is a very interesting case study in design. Thus the 787 battery problem, put it as a link please, 787 battery problem. I want people, now do not give me stories from media, newspapers give me authentic design data, give me, do not give me your, your views or somebody else's opinions. I want to know really what happened to the 787 battery, what was the problem, what was the source of the problem, how was it tackled, how much cost was incurred in solving the problem. I already gave you a hint about the numbers but I think the number is more than what I said and what is the current status. I would like to be educated through you via model about the 787 battery problem. So the, we know the battery is a problem but you cannot say okay let us get rid of the battery. The whole aircraft is designed across that battery now. So you cannot, you have to simply make it work within the constraints. So that is the problem that we always face in design. Right now here is a slide which talks about the process which is generally followed in 
developing a new aircraft okay see the initial portion of this course is a bit descriptive because we are getting hang of aircraft design we are getting a feel of what is there in store so you have two sides on the central line the central line is the activities which take place the conceptual design preliminary design detailed design these three are designs the three phases then you have flight testing some flight testing may take place also before detailed design it cannot sorry because there is no aircraft ready by that time okay uh, and then when you have complete flight testing you have production on the right and the left side are the items that feed this process so the conceptual design needs two things it needs the performance and cost goals so who gives this the customer or the user performance and cost goals and then you have on the left side mission requirements who gives that so if both of them are customer then why do you have two boxes no those are the requirements from air worthiness which are not even mentioned they are understood to be compulsory we don't even say that so that means there is some gulber right one of these two cannot be given by the customer common sense now if both are given by the customer why would i make two boxes i would have put one box and said mission requirements and performance and goals but there is a de linking they are on two different sides so what do you think so who gives the mission requirements definitely customer so fine i agree with you nobody else can give the user or the agency which wants to fly the aircraft they and only they are qualified to tell what they want to do with it performance and cost goals they will come from the competition so they will be generated internally by departments within the company which are dealing with the competition because the mission requirements are stated or expressed by the user everybody knows them okay they will be generally let's say defense there will be generally something called as a uh, rfi request for information they will say we want an aircraft with this 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 correct so that is floated and sent to everybody or put on the website and everybody can download it and receive it so that is for the user but performance and cost goals are coming internally so within the company the design group itself is going to create these performance and cost goals because they will say if we have to win this order or win this competition on technical grounds okay orders can be won and lost on non technical grounds also okay there could be commercial considerations two perfectly acceptable aircraft are offered to the customer the customer may buy one of them by some of the considerations they could be legal they could be illegal okay there could be things like corruption there could be things like preferential treatment we cannot discuss that we are not concerned about that we don't even know how to do i cannot make an aircraft corruption proof in design i am not qualified or enabled in that what i can even, what i can just teach you is okay guys if there is a mission requirement how do we do best so that the requirements can be met sometimes the so the selection so that is where whenever we talk about cost okay never go by purchase price of the aircraft as the cost of the aircraft because aircraft could be sold at a loss intentionally can you think of a scenario where a manufacturer is offering an aircraft intentionally at a loss to the customer what could be the reason market penetration is one reason what is it delay so delay is penalty so you supply it at some amount but there is a penalty because of delay the customer does not or the airline or the manufacturer does not intentionally uh, give it at a low price okay see sometimes market penetration or entering new markets is one area sometimes you want to retain a market market share in the hope that as my aircraft are sold in large quantities i will get back business in repairs maintenance overall so there is there i will make my money that could be the strategy so we don't discuss those things here that's why the cost at which an aircraft is available to an airline for sale never use that to validate your costing i tried that in my research and i was very frustrated because i was never able to match okay 
I developed some models or I used some models for cost estimation. I got the cost of an aircraft of 112 million dollars. When I go to the market, I find 80 million dollars may available. Then I began scratching my head, what is happening? So then I was told, don't worry, it should have been at that price. Your number is correct or seems correct. It's just that the manufacturer is in difficult times and they have some policy. So that we, we then enter into other areas. So we will not discuss all that. Okay. So therefore, performance and cost goals are coming within the organization so that we are able to beat the competition. Now, in preliminary design, yes. Part that we probably won't deal with, but is there a case as in say Bugatti sells the Bugatti Veyron and they make a loss on everything, but it's just a prestige point, it's the fastest. So is it a case in, uh, is there an example in the case of? Several examples. Several examples. I don't want to tell you, I want you to find out. It will be good to find out. No? There are many examples. There are instances where an aircraft is sold with engines free. Okay. Why? Because an engine is a very complicated, uh, very complicated part of the aircraft, and the airline will not normally able to do all the maintenance. When you study maintenance, you find there are many parts. There is some superficial maintenance and general maintenance. But after so many hours, it has to go to the OEM, original equipment manufacturer. Okay. Each blade costs such a large amount of money. And the blades have to be replaced after so many hours of flight. So the maintenance manual is decided on the basis of a kind of a negotiation between the airline and the manufacturer. So the manufacturer recommends saying, okay, after 80 flying hours, okay, so let's say, a, a typical example, after 10 landings, a military aircraft landing, your tire has to be changed. So now, if Messier Hispano Bugatti, which makes a landing gears for aircraft, they have some kind of a deal with the tire supplier. And if they know that if I sell 100 landing, if I sell 100 aircraft, and my landing gears get sold, I know that after so many operations, I get I have to get so many tires sold. So if they figure out that a small loss in the initial supply is nothing compared to the lifetime running of selling of these tires, they may underprice their. So these are all marketing and you know commercial. We cannot study them here. So there are many examples in literature about not only aircraft but various products like the one you mentioned intentionally underpriced because we want to enter the market. Okay. One very famous case study is about Procter and Gamble. When they entered the, in the country, they came up with a, uh, a powder which was supposed to compete with surf. Okay. So they had a target that we are going to lose 10 crores per year for the next so many years in India. No problem. They have very deep pockets. But after some time, when the product got established in the country, they are reaping the dividends of that. So similarly, uh, many things happen in the marketing and the commercial side which we don't understand or appreciate. For that, you should be in some other classroom, not in this classroom. In this classroom, we can only talk about facts. That if you have this, 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 this material, this, this, this component, it should cost so much. Actually, what it sells is totally a marketing decision. Okay, so we have internal testing and we have CFD simulations. Both of them are feeding into the preliminary design. But internal testing is not the only thing. You can also think of FEM analysis and detail analysis. Now, there are some students in the class who are very busy with their mobile phones while I am speaking. I can see who they are. I don't want to point fingers, but I would like to request them. It's not fair. It's not fair for you to come to the class and then spend the time looking at your phones. You have a welcome, you are welcome, attendance sign karke, you can leave the classroom. Okay. But don't make me, you know, don't make me uh, point out fingers at you. This process is an evolutionary process. This process is happening slowly. But this is not the process we follow nowadays. This is old. This was taught when I was a student. Now, let's look at one more, one more process which has been adapted from the book by Raymer. Okay. So what Raymond says is that three things, the requirements, the concepts and technology and the requirements here are from both customer and regulatory body. Using them, we arrive at the general layout. 
as I mentioned to you, layout is basically the relative location of various components, okay. So we generally decide what kind of configuration it will be. After that we go for initial sizing and layout which we will do, the next thing in the class would be initial sizing and layout, okay. Then Raymer says it goes to aerodynamics, after that it goes to propulsion, then it goes to mass estimation, etc. And then there are some iterations, etc., etc. But this is old technology. It does not happen like this anymore. Today we have what is called as concurrent engineering or we have what is called as a multidisciplinary approach in which all happens at the same time. So if you see something in a textbook, first look at the year of publication. And if you find that the publication year is a 1999 such as in this case 2006. You can assume that this was the information there or before it. Do not take that as the truth for today. Things are done much differently today. Today we do not have the luxury of doing first aerodynamics and then pass on. It does not all of them work together on everything because nowadays we have facilities where the basic configuration is stored in the computer and everybody can access it simultaneously at the same time. So there is no need for you to really do, you do this and then we wait till you come, that does not happen, okay. So when we start considering design, we start looking at some decisions, we have to make some decisions. So are we going to go for an aircraft with jet engines or a propeller? Are we going to go for a land based aircraft or an amphibian aircraft? Are we going to go for wing mounted engines or tail mounted engines? Each of these points, each of these decisions are based on certain very standard reasons. Seldom in design we have a freedom that oh I like rear mounted engines, they look good so I just put it. So let us see for example, wing mounted engines or tail mounted engines. Can we quickly have a discussion in the class, what could be the reasons why someone might prefer tail mounted engines compared to the wing mounted engines. What do you think? Yes. Smooth flow over the wings, that is very right. So you do not want to have smooth flow when you have wing mounted engines? Agreed. So then all the designers who put engines on the wing, they do not have any problem in disturbing the flow? All right. So then can you tell me, one minute, what would be the benefit of putting engines below the wing? Because you are right, the aerodynamics of the wings get disturbed. So, uh, very good, so correct, very right. Now the question is why are fuel tanks in the wing? So what you are saying is that the fuselage volume is reserved for other things. If you put fuel there, there will be less volume for cargo or passengers. Agree, okay. That is not the reason actually. Actually, I will tell you it is a regulatory requirement, okay. No passenger aircraft can carry fuel in the fuselage. Why do you think so? Simply safety. Because during accidents, normally it is the fuselage that starts rubbing the ground first in all ground accidents. And if it carries fuel, it will probably be in the bottom there will be more chance of fire. Even now with wings airplanes catch fire, but if you put them in the fuselage, okay, there will be more chance of fire. So the regulatory bodies have said, have decided by experience, no fuel in the fuselage for transport aircraft. But military aircraft, no problem. Almost all military aircraft I know, they have fuel tanks in the fuselage, okay. So, if you cannot put the fuel in the fuselage because of regulatory bodies, the only option you have is wings and also tails. So there are some aircraft, big aircraft like 380 which carry huge amount of fuel in the tails because a tail of 380 is almost as big as a wing of 737. <laughs> so it is like a wing, so it contains fuel. Right? So, okay. So, if you are, if you have to carry fuel in the wings, where to put the engine nearby? So, the piping is small because otherwise you have to put long piping, you have to pressurize it longer. 
any other benefit of putting wings on or uh, putting uh, engine on the wings yes very right very right wings uh, the, the the engines are heavy okay so if they are near the cg then there will not be great problem so because you know all designers are grappling with the cg location where should the cg be longitudinal cg of the aircraft where should it be i don't know neutral point okay so do we have difficulty in cg normally are we fighting forward cg location or rear cg location no 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 forward cg location we don't fight in the sense maintaining cg near the forward limit is never a problem normally the cg is always behind and you are fighting to bring it forward you get my point see there is a forward limit there is a rear limit okay now what gives the forward limit what imposes a forward limit on the cg location of the aircraft look these are all questions which you are supposed to know from your courses on flight dynamics if you don't know okay if you, for whatever reason whether you are not taught or whether you forgot please brush up these are simple things which i expect aerospace engineers in this particular stage to know if you don't know then you know there is something wrong so tell me most forward cg and most rear cg what are the things that limit yes too stable yeah so what i when it is too stable correct so maneuverability in pitch is a constant about how how much how much unstable aircraft you can control right so if it goes beyond neutral point it will be unstable yeah. but do you have an aircraft with cg behind neutral point yeah. yes all military aircraft are not all not all not all actually still few still few modern high performance combat aircraft which have either an artificial or a relaxed static stability or they have a fly aware control system they are the ones which can manage to operate with cg behind because it gives you and because you have a flyover control system you can regularly and constantly keep on providing the moments artificially to balance the aircraft okay right so now on a on a aircraft like this transport aircraft like this wing mounted engines they will have some benefits that's why many aircraft or most of them do i'm sure if i ask you most of you would say that in general you have seen aircraft only with wing mounted engines you must have seen very few aircraft with tail mounted engines right or rear mounted engines that means wing mounted engine is kind of standard so one reason is keep the engine near the fuel agreed you said something about structural weight distribution you wanted it to be near the cg agreed any other reason yes we will have lift loading okay so if there are engines on the wing then there will be less lift load net load so you are you are saying that the lift the wing is designed mainly to take care of the lifting force if i put a heavy thing like engine i am relieving okay so this is called as bending moment relief and this is the answer to one of the questions in the quiz this is one benefit of putting engines on the fuselage so then why would somebody put engine on the back cg is moving back bending moment relief is not there now why would you put engine on the back side let me ask some people in the class okay wait a minute let's let's get some new people on board yes can you answer can you answer yes what do you think maybe you don't know but can you apply your mind what, what is the benefit of putting engine on the back side ask your neighbor yes oh, see i know that you don't know the answer but that doesn't mean you should say i don't know i you can think na and you can just say maybe because of this maybe because of that we are all here to learn so think about it give me one possible uh, benefit give me one possible benefit of having engines behind because from both these considerations center of gravity control as well as from the location near the fuel they are bad okay let's see what you say they are not a, they don't worry about not being sure or being sure very good in fact in fact if the engine is on the back you have to move elevators away such as you see in this figure you have to move them away because otherwise 
a very hot exhaust will be hitting the tail. Okay, so you are right actually, but what you are telling me is what to do because engine is behind. You have not told me why engine is behind. <laughs> you got my point? Because engine is behind, the elevator has to be moved away. Yes, anybody else? No, that is not the case. Uh, nobody will design a weak, a weak wing for an aircraft. The wings, uh, in fact, as he mentioned, the wings will be actually better. They will perform better if you have engines because they will relieve. They will relieve the wing. See, the maximum load comes on the aircraft wings when it is carrying the full expected lift, which would be the load factor times the weight. And that could be probably 3, 4. So, 4 times the weight it has to carry. If I hang engines, you are relieving it actually. So, from structural point of view, you cannot have a situation of having. Yes? Noise production maybe. Engine, when it is mounted on the wing, maybe the flow hits the tail and produces a lot of noise. They don't confuse the effect of engine on the tail, okay. But you are right, it is because of noise. The primary reason why somebody would put engine on the fuselage on the back side is it is behind the passenger cabin, so the noise generated. Now noise is two types, there is something called as a near field noise and a far field noise. Far field is what happens on the ground or to far away places. That won't be affected whether you have engine on, on the wing or the tail, but near field noise the noise inside the cabin will be affected. So, typically we expect the cabin noise to be not more than 80 decibels, a general ballpark number. And there is a marked improvement and reduction if you have engines mounted on the rear. So, you are right, okay. There is one more reason, can you think of it? One reason is less noise in the cabin. No, not, really, not necessary. Now, what you are doing is, you are actually challenging the intelligence of the aerodynamicist, okay. That the aerodynamicist cannot handle an engine near the fuselage, but can handle the engine near the near the wing. No, by careful design, by proper internal testing, we can have. Yes, I agree. One thing that the engines near the fuselage will have will have disturbed inlet flow because all said and done, there will be some scrubbing of the air along the fuselage. So the flow the flow that is encountered by a wing mounted engine will be better than that is by the tail mounted engine. I agree with that. So, inlet losses will be larger. But by careful blending and design, you can take care of it. Okay. So, that is not the reason to put the engine behind. My question is, why would a designer at a top level decide to put engine behind? One answer is clear cut, less noise level in the cabin. What else? I think uh, if we put the engine from the engines might also okay so what you are saying is that the thrust line located behind is better no uh, not really because uh, whether you put the engine on the wing or in the fuselage on the back uh, the moment created because of the thrust may not be too much different so, uh, this is not really a reason, there is much something much more fundamental, you had some point. So, if let us say plane moving a crash landing, so right. if, you have tail, uh, if you have tail mounted engines, it is less chances of them coming in contact and rubbing against the ground. Okay, safety. Yes. Sir. Okay, safety could be one consideration, yes, you are right. I mean, um, in case of a crash landing, chances of the engine hitting the ground and then causing damage etc are more. If the engine are on the back side, there will be a belly landing and maybe the engine will not catch fire. But this is a very weak argument. It is an argument, but I have not heard of any designer saying that I put engines behind because, because during crash there will be more chance. Okay, It could be, what you say is right, but that is not a driving category. There is something much more straightforward. Yes. Perfect. That is fantastic. Fantastic. They understand this point. You need to have multiple engines if you need to have more than some number of passengers. When you have multiple engines, there is a chance one of them will fail. Now, if all fail, then God help you. Okay. There have been cases when all engines have failed and people have glided to safety. Okay. But we do not design for all engine failure case. It is too critical a case to design. Okay. Yes, we do need to have adequate gliding characteristics of an aircraft when all engines fail. 
But the LBID of a typical transport aircraft is not so high that all engine keys will always save you. We design for one engine failure. Now, when the one engine failure, as you said, maybe the port or the starboard. Now, do you know what is meant by port and starboard? Yes or no? How many of you don't know? Okay, this term has come in aviation from shipping industry. Okay, starboard means the right side as the pilot sees. Pilot's right side is called starboard, and pilot's left side is called as port. And port is where the ships used to come and dock. So it's called as port side and the starboard side. So let's say the port engine has conked off for some reason. Now there will be imbalance of moment. The imbalance will be less in the fuel as mounted engine because the moment arm is less. So the design of the control system to overcome the rudder. How do you overcome adverse uh, yaw by rudder? So the sizing of the rudder and the vertical tail will be affected by one engine out case. That problem will be less severe with wing uh, tail mounted engines compared to wing. So this is one very very valid reason. You have one more reason. Oh, you Honda Jet. By the way, Honda Jet is wing mounted engine. Well, I know, but they have put. You know, they have. We'll we'll discuss Honda Jet. Very good. With Honda Jet is one case study in our course. When we come to that point, we will answer this argument. Uh, <clears throat> basically, if you have if you have a wing. Which is designed with very high laminar flow or natural laminar flow. Okay, please remember. Do you know the meaning of natural laminar flow? Okay, the meaning of NLF is natural uh, laminar flow produced without any active or passive devices, simply by the shaping and the aerodynamic shaping of the aerofoils. Okay, so. There are certain wings which are designed with enhanced. Now, why would you like to have laminar flow on the wing? Which drag? Less drag, but which drag? In friction. Okay. So, laminar flow, if it can be maintained, is a very desirable feature. Typically, one third the drag compared to turbulent flow, but it is highly unstable. So, you can design for laminar flow, but It may trip to turbulent very quickly because of many many disturbances. Simply imperfection in manufacturing or some rivet pointing out, it can create, it can trigger turbulent flow. So, if you design the aircraft to have laminar flow, then you would like to have a very clean wing because then you can make it a small wing. Then you don't want to have anything like engine nearby. So, all aircraft which have rear-mounted engines, notice their wings are very small, small in size. Because they have been designed to put engine away, they want to have undisturbed flow on the wing because the wing is designed to mostly have laminar flow. So it's not very straightforward. These decisions are taken after many trade studies. No one starts by saying, "Okay, we'll put wing on the uh, engine on the back side." They will put it, they will study, and then there will be a decision. As I mentioned, in conceptual design, you will actually get many many configurations, and then you decide one of them. And you say frozen. We will go ahead with it. Okay. So these are the kind of change. Yes. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I've only observed rear-mounted engines, luxury or private kind of jets. There a reason for that? They are the most noise-conscious people, na? They are the guys who are paying money to travel. They are businessmen. They want to have peaceful flight. So you and me will look at the fare. Okay. So. Cattle class, we are cattle class, normal, normal, uh, normal uh, economy class. Okay, we don't mind little bit noise in the cabin. If I get less noise at no extra payment, I'm happy. Okay, but these people, the business aviation people, or the people who own their aircraft, they are more concerned about traveling in luxury. So you, there, there is where you will mostly find. There is one more reason why you can have rear mounted. I mean, then we can discuss it later on. We can endlessly discuss these points. Let's move on. We are already at twelve. Uh, we have half an hour remaining. Let's understand now about requirements capture, and I'll take some slides which I've already shown you probably in the course on in introduction to engineering design. But still, I'll go there. So let's understand. Let's revive our memory. What exactly is meant by requirements capture? What is requirements capture in design? People on the back, why are they so silent? Is my voice reaching you or not? 
So last guy on the bench, what is your name? Yes. Nikhil, what is my requirements capture? What do you understand by these words? You can sit down. Speak loudly because I have a mic you do not have. What comes to your mind when you hear these words, requirements capture? Just express that. Meeting stakeholders and then knowing about their requirements. Okay, fair enough. Capturing the requirements of the stakeholder. But what is the problem? Why do you have to capture? Why this capture? Yeah. Why, why do you have this requirement of capture? Why not requirement study or requirement collection? Why do we use the word capture? What do you feel? Because we have to do some processing on what the customer says. And it is desirable but not always possible to convert the expression of the customer like I want a good aircraft, I want a cheap aircraft, I want a nice aircraft into numbers. Now how do you convert I want a good aircraft into a number? What is good? Can we have a scale 1 to 10 on good? So then you interact, you have a dialogue with the customer. What do you mean by good? Will it be good if it looks good or will it be good if it is less costly to operate? They will say I want both. I want a good looking aircraft which is less expensive to operate. Okay, which do you want more? What is the weightage you want to give? Do you want to say 80% weightage to cost effectiveness and 5% to good looks and 5% to something else? We do not know, right? The customer has something. So, extracting the requirements from the statement of the customer so that you can do some design. You cannot do design based on customer's emotions, the customer's desire, the customer's wishes. You need some numbers in front of you. So, that is requirements capture. But in short, it is just trying to understand not what the customer says, but what the customer actually and exactly wants. There is a huge difference between what the customer says and what the customer actually wants. And if you do not get it right, you will design a very beautiful, very nice aircraft which you think is what the customer wants, but it will be a commercial failure. So, any example comes to your mind of an aircraft which was designed assuming some customer requirements exist, but they are not there and therefore it became a commercial failure, technical marvel but commercial failure. Concorde is one example that comes to our mind. Beautiful aircraft, very well designed aircraft, but the whole premise for that aircraft was that there will be a large amount of the large number of people or I should say sufficiently large number of people to support a market in which a passenger aircraft can travel supersonic and save time and they would be prepared to pay a premium for it. It turned out that except for initial novelty, initial excitement and maybe you know pride or some kind of a differentiation that you know I am great, I travel by Concorde and you do not, you travel by Belgadi, whatever. So, after that, that whole novelty wore off and then they were struggling to find passengers. Passengers said, you are saving me 3 hours in flight from Paris to New York, but you are charging me 1200 uh, pounds, where I can get a seat for 600 pounds or 500 pounds. So, I do not want to spend, I do not have such a high value of time. So, after some time, it became a commercial failure. So, I am not saying that it is a bad design or a wrong design, I am just saying the, the designers of Concorde or the people who plan Concorde, they were very confident that you know there will be a market, they have their own market studies, they have their own logic to say yes it is needed, but it turned out that there was no need. So therefore, it is a commercial failure. Yes. No, Concorde was able to meet the noise requirements, but the problem is to meet the noise requirements, they had to fly only over the sea. 
So there were severe restrictions on the routing that they could follow. So other airlines which had a less noisy aircraft were able to fly more efficient routes between two cities, okay? But they had to go over the sea primarily because they were not able to meet the specified noise regulations for over the land flights. Now that became a restriction, right? So they thought we will overcome it and they thought that, you know, it's just a challenge which has to be tackled, we will do it. But in reality, it didn't happen. Okay, so this is very important, right? Not only understanding what the customer wants, but the customer wants many things. There are some priorities. The customer may not state explicitly. So you have to figure out. How do you figure out? QFD is used after you understand, little bit. Because for QFD, you need priorities. After you, after you get those priorities, remember 30 percent, 40 percent, then you can start looking at what features I must provide to meet these qualities. But unless you have the priorities, you can't even start QFD. So how do you do this? This is a field on its own where you have to have something like a interaction with the customer, a dialogue with the customer, you write some detailed survey and the customer fills in or many customers fill in, okay. After that we start this, why? I have the priorities now. Now I under identify the features in the design that will first of all help meeting these requirements and then it will read. Now this is one tool to do this is QFD which we have studied in the design class. Also you have to be very careful about what is available in the market and what the other people are doing for that same requirement. Otherwise, by the time you come to the market, you will have a fantastic product but nobody wants it because somebody else has come up with a better product. And nobody will buy, hey, these people have worked very hard, so let us encourage them. When you buy a mobile phone in the market, do you say, oh, this company has done lot of R&D, they have spent billions of dollars, let us buy, let us support them. You always say, no, no, my requirement is all these features and then this one gives me the same thing at lower cost. You go there. So, the market is very ruthless. So, it is very important that while you do the design, you have to be very careful about what. Now, this you will do when you do a competitive design in the class. You might do it in the design lab next semester because we may not have enough time for it. So, what will happen is you will be given some requirements and you will all have your own configurations. When you have a, when you present your design, you must have seen this in our exercise. You have done the exercise with me, right? DD exercise. What happened there? People got up and said that design is not good. It doesn't meet the requirement on thermal. Their architectural design is not good. One is to find faults. The other is ours is better because we do this. So what was that? All competition only. And much more fierce and much more rigorous competition takes place in aircraft design companies where each and every aspect of the aircraft is criticized to the airline and they say we are better, we will give you this, we will give you that. So you need to do all these things in the design if you want to really do it in the market. So here is an example, now you cannot read this, I also can read with great difficulty, it is meant for Moodle study. I was very interested to know what were the first requirements given which were replied by Wright brothers. Wright brothers you know or you may not know. They made the first aircraft. So what were the requirements for which they designed Wright Flyer 1? Fly. So what do you mean by fly? But there were many people who had control flight before them. Heavier than air power. There were many before that. Do you know of any aircraft which was heavier than air and power? Yeah, so there are four things which they did together. You should know that as aerospace engineering students. Before them, there were many people who had manned flight, okay, but on balloons. So that's not heavier than air. Many people had control flight. Lily Anthel, for example, flew so many gliders before Wright brothers. Beautifully controlled, but not powered. Controlled, but not powered. So then 
the thing which demarked them from others is sustained. They were able to sustain it, okay, 12 seconds only, the first flight, but they were able to sustain. So, sustained, controlled, heavier than air, manned and powered. They were the first to do all of them together. So, who gave the requirements to them? There was no customer. They were the customers. They have their own requirements. But these are the requirements flashed on the screen and later on in the Moodle against which they won their first order of supply of an aircraft to the US uh, Air Force. So, this is an ad for ad and spec for a heavier than air flying machine. So, they want they want a proposal in duplicate by 12 noon on 1st Feb 1908. 1908 ka requirement hai. Read it, it is very interesting. How will they, what will they check, on what basis will they accept, what all do they want? Okay, these are very old, this is historical, the first aircraft specifications. And in response to this, the Wright brothers won a competition to supply their first aircraft to the US uh, military. These are some typical requirements for a multi rail jet fighter, MJF, just the name. Okay. Now, read these requirements and tell me how much do you understand and ask me questions about anything that you do not understand. Some of the words in this might be new for you. Yes. Yeah, NM is nautical mind. Now, this is something that I want all of you to understand once and for all. Hmm? Nautical mile is a standard term for measuring distance in aviation. How much is it? It is 1.853 kilometers. From now on, I will never repeat this. Do not ask me in the quizzes or exams. Put it in your brain. Note down wherever you want. One nautical mile is 1.853 kilometers. That is it. You will not be told this number again in this course, at least by me. And if you tell me in the quiz, I do not know, I cannot solve, you will get a zero for it. This is important. You need to know the language of your field. So, nautical miles, 1.853 kilometers is a term. So, they want a combat mission radius of 400 nautical miles. Okay. What is combat mission radius, anybody? There is something called as radius of action, very similar to this. So, <clears throat> when this aircraft is engaging in combat, not training, not joyride, etc., when there is a combat, it should be able to have capacity to go this distance and come back. That is the radius. Okay. So, what do you mean by combat? There must be a mission. So, I will show you the next slide will contain the mission profile. So, what they are asking is, you should be able to design the aircraft that can do this mission and come back and the distance to be travelled should be 400 and back laterally. You may have to climb and descend and all that, that is different. Total distance forward and backward. So, you put a point, you put a compass on the map and draw a circle of 400 nautical mile radius, it should be able to attack and come back that place. Okay, weapons payload, two AM-120, four two thousand mount MK-84. Now, what is AM-120? AM-120 is a very, very popular missile. Okay, AIM-120 is a very popular missile. We will discuss about this missile also. Uh, it is a standard con uh, configuration on one of the aircraft. So, they want two missiles. Basically, these are wing tip mounted missiles. So, one on each wing. So, the basic aircraft is considered to be having these two missiles. It is not considered to be additional payload. Aircraft with two missiles is standard and there are four 2000 pounds MK Mark 84 bombs. These are heavy bombs, large size bombs, 2000 of pounds each weight. So, with this weapons and 600 rounds of 20 mm ammunition, the, this aircraft is supposed to have an inbuilt cannon or a gun which should have 600 rounds of ammunition which is 20 mm caliber quite a large, it weighs around 240-250 grams each bullet. So, imagine a bullet coming at you at 250 grams weight, imagine the kinetic energy at which it comes to you. Okay. Then take off distance, landing distance 2000 feet, now there is a doubt here, what is this distance, I told you about the thing, so we have to ask the customer, what is the 2000, ask the, yeah, we have to, we have to ask the customer, what is the 2000 feet, 
maximum mark number is 1.8 at optimum altitude and WMA. WMA A is a subscript which says maneuver weight. Maneuver weight is the expected aircraft weight during the maneuvers which is half the internal fuel. So, half the fuel is gone in reaching the combat area, but we have two AMRAM missiles. AM-120 is, uh, there are many missile types. AMRAM is one of them. Advanced medium range air to air missile. That is AMRAM. Advanced medium range air to air missiles. They are used by the aircraft to shoot down other aircraft. They are not used for air to ground combat. Okay. They are for self protection. Therefore, they are considered to be part of the aircraft. They should always have two of them when they go. Full cannon ammunition. That means all the 600 rounds, but no bombs, no rockets, no other air to ground weapons. That is called as maneuver weight. Half the internal fuel, two missiles, all the bullets, everything else gone. Now you can do the maneuvering of the aircraft. So, at that particular weight, it should be able to fly at Mach 1.8, but altitude is your choice. You decide that we will give you 1.8 Mach number at a height of 10,000 feet or 10,000 meters or 12,000 meters. So, the designer is not being forced to say, uh, is not being forced to design at a given altitude. Okay. As long as you can show that it can fly at 1.8 Mach number at some altitude, under the configuration, you have met the requirement. Okay. Then you have instantaneous turn rate, 18 degrees per second at Mach 0.9 at that altitude and at the maneuver weight. Now, what is meant by instantaneous turn rate? There are two turn rates, instantaneous turn rate and sustained turn rate. What is the difference between them? Have you been taught this? Yes. So, somebody says no, somebody says yes. It should be there. You must have had a personal aircraft performance. This is very, this is one of the standard things. I learnt it during my second year BTEC in the performance course. What is sustained turn rate? Yes, let me see if you can answer. Sustained turn rate. See, you are confusing roll with turn. Everyone there for roll. Why are you bringing roll? Why are you bringing rolling for turning? Turning is on the your plane. Better. So, so it's not clear to me. When is a turn sustained? When? And when is it? When is it instantaneous? Anybody else can throw, you have some idea? Anybody in the class? TAs cannot answer. TAs are, have already gone, undergone the course, so they are supposed to know it. But a good try. Yes, anybody else? What do you sustain? Yes. Rest? No, long time. Yeah. Short moment and long moment. So, in a sustained, now note this down, in a sustained turn rate, you are not allowed to lose altitude or lose speed while maintaining the altitude and maintaining the speed i must turn at that rate that is called a sustained turn rate in the instantaneous turn rate i can lose altitude i can lose speed i can lose both and achieve some turn rate so it's instantaneous it's not much use it is of some use but not much use because if you do some instantaneous turn rate of 30 degree per second, you really cannot use it for any serious combat advantage. You cannot, unless you are able to sustain it, because the enemy is being chased, right? So, if you say I can do 30 degree per second, but I can't maintain it, then you have a target available to the other guy. So, sustained turn rate is, the, is, a, is more important than a, than a instantaneous turn rate. In fact, you will learn in this course that this instantaneous turn rate depends only on the lift capability of the aircraft, on CL. It is a pure aerodynamic parameter. Sustained turn rate involves aerodynamics and propulsion because thrust also has to be sufficient to overcome the drag in flight. So, 18 degree per second so and so. Then PS. What do you mean by PS? Specific excess power, SCP. Anybody knows? Have you been taught this term in performance courses? There is a very valid or a very well accepted term called as specific excess power. Power, you know what is power? First into velocity. 
excess power will be power available minus power required, power required will be dragged into velocity. So, T minus D is the excess force available. So, T minus D into V will be excess power. The specific excess power is T minus D into V upon W per unit weight. We call it as PS. Now, the specific excess power is a tradable commodity in the sense you can use it to do something. You can climb, you can accelerate in level flight or you can have an accelerated climb, both. Okay. So, if you have PS of 800 feet per second and if somebody else has a PS of 400 feet per second, you are better than that at that condition. You have more specific excess power which you can trade for acceleration or climb or both. So, the requirement here is 800 feet per second PS at Mach 0.9 at so and so feet at maneuver weight. And then there is a sustained, sustained uh, G or sustained turn rate. So, it is 4G at Mach 1.2 and 9G at Mach 0.9 at different altitudes. So, we have the requirements. Okay. Now, the aircraft that was, ah, now this is the mission. So, you take off from some airstrip, you have a very quick climb, you do not have a general, general climb, you are in a combat scenario. Yeah. See, uh, <coughs> G is basically defined as the longitudinal pull up. Okay. So, uh, sorry, uh, lateral, lateral turn. So, when we say 4G turn, we are basically expressing turn rate in terms of G. I will explain to you when I come to that portion, how you can convert G into turn rate. Because they are related. It is basically flight in a horizontal circle. When it is sustained, the level is, the height is constant. So, the rate at which you turn, the omega is V squared by 2G. So, from there you can make, you can get G in terms of omega. So, they are both same, just a way of saying it. This is the mission profile given for the same joint, uh, multiple, multi rail jet fighter. So, you have a, you have a accelerated climb and then you climb to an altitude called as the best cruise altitude and you fly at the best cruise Mach number, not specified. You have to calculate this for your aircraft. Then you go to some area where you have to fight you go down that is ingress, you deliver the ordinance and then you search for other areas, then you egress, again go back to some altitude which is convenient for you, which is the best for you and come down and land. Okay? And the aircraft designed for the requirements was F-16. So, these requirements which I told you are for F-16 and in our course we will very soon analyze these requirements and come up with wing loading and first loading for F-16 and I will show to you that those numbers are very similar to what are the actual numbers. That is the power of conceptual design. Alright. Now, different aircraft types have different design considerations. So, broadly speaking, can you tell me what are the very different types of aircraft? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, let us first look at two categories broadly. Peaceful use and military use. Let us let's distinguish between violent and non-violent uses, <laughs> so to say. Now, the violent will also be defense. So, it is not violent, it is self-defense. So, you could say civil and military. Okay. Now, forget military right now. In civil, what do you have? You said cargo, passenger. The passenger could be luxury or individual. Okay. Luxury could be People like Mr. Ambani, okay? he is not flying it, somebody else is flying it, but he wants to travel in luxury. So, it could be luxury, so you call them a business. Huh? Mostly they are jets, mostly, so we call them business jets, but there could also be business props. So, business aircraft or aircraft, luxury aircraft, passenger aircraft and aircraft for individuals. The name given to these aircraft is general aviation, when an aircraft is used by individuals for himself, herself or family or friends. We call it as general aviation, GA, general aviation. What is the bottom line there? Nobody should be paying any money to travel in that aircraft. So, they are called as non-fair non -fair paying passengers. You may take friends, you may take classmates, you may take business mates, colleagues, but you are the owner. 
you fly yourself your family or your friends not for commercial purpose you cannot carry cargo and say i am earning money out of it so general aviation and then you have business then you have civil or commercial aircraft then you have cargo right cargo could be dedicated cargo no passenger on board only cargo or it could be like in most transport aircraft you carry cargo in the belly so it could be uh, half half there are some aircraft which also come as a mixed configuration adjustable i'll show you a video of that next time if i can get time so now here is a uh, here is a question i want to ask you okay. when i had a discussion with my ts about how to run this course i got a feedback from them that this course is very descriptive so far what have we done have you touched pen to paper did you open your calculator okay now i can run the entire course like this i can give you some gyan some basic information but design is by doing i will say design is by doing but i'll not make you do anything that's not design that's just talking about design design is about doing so the feedback i got is that the numerical portion in the course is less we should have inject more numerical portion it can get boring after some time you just keep on talking about what is there what is there and all that show some pictures fancy videos this is not design so what i have decided this time is an experiment i have four presentations one on supersonic car supersonic transport aircraft mostly on concorde one on general aviation aircraft one on civil transport aircraft one on military aircraft with various types okay this year i'm not going to talk about them i am going to upload the presentations and maybe some other material on moodle and you are going to read it yourself and you are going to be quizzed about it okay some people have sent me mail saying don't take surprise quizzes please inform us about the quiz okay i'll inform you about the quiz so that you are not surprised you don't get a shock of your life when you come here <laughs> Okay. fine so you will be told about the quiz that there is a quiz on so and so date um as soon as possible i am not saying that i'll give you one month notice and all that i'll give you sufficient notice whatever i can give you so <clears throat> do you agree with this fine because it is all descriptive it is all learning and we have the moodle for asking questions so any query you have about any feature i will next time i'm going to have one more descriptive talk about the configuration the name of the talk is why do aircraft look like the way they do and it is a talk borrowed from professor william mason i will use his material to talk about configuration co options that people have and then we move on to some numerical exercises fine so we meet next time <clears throat>